Welcome to Akatink Unitarian Universalist Church live stream worship service. I'm Judy Robison, your worship associate for today, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Akatink UU Church is a welcoming and inclusive community that seeks to create a more just and compassionate world through our actions to bring about justice and by honoring the web of nature of which we are a part. All are welcome here, no matter whom you love, no matter your identity or heritage, no matter your beliefs or background, no matter your means or gifts, you are welcome here in this religious community. If you are new to Akatink and you would like to talk more about this church, please be sure to reach out to me, to our minister, Reverend Pippin, or a member of the board. Contact information is posted on our website at www.akatinkuu.org. On our website, you can check the online order of service on the worship section of the webpage. While you're on website, be sure to check our events page for upcoming virtual gatherings and other news. I now invite you to close your other windows and apps and devices, take a deep breath, and center yourself for worship. I am very happy to introduce our guest minister for this morning, a familiar face to many of us. Reverend Rebecca Benner is a lifelong Unitarian Universalist and a minister who served this congregation from 2000 to 2007. She still lives in Burke with her husband, Derek, and is a full-time at-home parent for their three children, Alden, 13, Elias, 9, and Jasper, who is 6. They attend the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Fairfax. It is a great pleasure to be with you this morning. Although I wish we could be in shared space together and that I could see all of your beautiful faces, I'm honored to be able to lead worship for this community, which is so dear to my heart. Let us begin with these worship words by Gretchen Haley. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? In these days, we find ourselves too often stuck with these questions on repeat. What's going to happen? Will everything be okay? What can I do? We grasp at signs and markers, articles of news and analysis, Facebook memes and forwarded emails, as if the new Zodiac was capable of forecasting all that life may yet bring our way. As if we could prepare, as if life had ever made any promise of making sense or turning out the way we'd thought, as if we are not also actors in this still unfolding story. For this hour, we gather to surrender to the mystery, to release ourselves from the needing to know, the yearning to have it all already figured out, and also the burden of believing we either have all the control or none. Here in our song and our silence, our stories and our sharing, we make space for a new breath, a new healing, a new possibility to take root. That is courage, forged in the fire of our coming together and felt in the spirit that comes alive in this act of faith, that we believe still a new world is possible, that we are creating it already, here and now. Come, let us worship together. The words for our chalice lighting are by Sarah Eileen Lawal. Out of the flames of fear, we rise with the courage of our deepest convictions to stand for justice, inclusion, and peace. Out of the flames of scrutiny, we rise to proclaim our faith 
with hope to heal a fractured and hurting world. Out of the flames of doubt, we rise to embrace the mystery, wonder, and awe of all there is and all that is yet to be. Out of the flames of hate, we rise with the force of love, love that celebrates our shared humanity. Out of the flames, we rise. I now invite you into a time of prayer and meditation. As we try to quiet our minds and hearts and enter into the presence of this moment, of one another, and of the holy that resides within and among us. We gather today, not with our physical selves, but with the spirit of yearning, which leads us to seek out community and connection, calling us to be together, even as we remain apart. <clears throat> On this particular day, we find ourselves at the beginning of a new season of warmth and light. And on a day set aside to celebrate fathers. Like all holidays designed to recognize people in our lives, Father's Day is not a simple day. For many, it is painful or complicated as we mourn fathers no longer with us, or wish for a kind of father we never had, or feel doubt about our ability to be the kind of father we want to be, or wonder if we will ever get to be a father in the way we hope to. And so truly living this day means living all of it, the joy and gratitude and forgiveness, and also the sadness and ambivalence and loss. Let us remember that who we decide to honor this day need not be limited by biology or gender. We can give thanks to all of those of whatever gender and relationship who have played the role of guide and nurturer and support as we have moved through our lives. As we sit together in silence for a moment, I invite you to think of those who have accompanied you on your way who fathered you at some point in your life, who helped make you who you are. For all of those who shared of themselves so we might know ourselves to be strong and worthy and loved, we give thanks. Let us be in silence together. Amen. The reading is titled, A Litany for Survival by Audre Lorde. For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone, for those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going, in the hours between dawns, looking inward and outward, at once before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures, like bread in our children's mouths, so their dreams will not reflect the death of ours. For those of us who were imprinted with fear, like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hoped to silence us. For all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, 
we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak remembering we were never meant to survive. I remember well an incident from some years ago. I was driving and apparently distracted because in changing lanes, I cut in much too close to a big pickup truck beside me. Luckily, we didn't have an accident, but the driver of the truck had to hit his brakes hard in order to avoid me. He then laid on his horn, swung around me, and made a hand gesture that I'm sure you all can imagine. At first, my reaction was an uncomfortable mix of guilt, after all, I had been at fault for sure, and defensive anger in return. He didn't know me. Why was he so angry about a small mistake that resulted in no harm to anyone? But I got a look at the driver's face as he sped by me in the left lane. And what I saw there, beneath the bluster and the gesture, was fear. I had made him afraid. And I suspect it was that, more than anything else, that made him so angry. As soon as I recognized his fear, I was able to fear, feel my own fear, both at the near accident and at his response. Suddenly, at least in my own understanding, we weren't two people in opposition to one another, but rather two people who had just shared a frightening experience. This is a fearful time. I don't know of anyone these days who isn't afraid of something, of getting sick or our loved ones getting sick, of not having enough income or enough food to eat, of being alone, of being injured or killed while simply going about daily life, of not being able to hold on to hard-won mental or emotional health, of how this time is affecting our children or grandchildren, of the continued dangers of climate change, of the seeming disintegration of our understanding of ourselves as part of the same human community, of the uncertainty that envelops everything. And even though we are all afraid, that fear has not brought us together. If anything, it often seems to pull us further apart. Some of that, perhaps, is because we are afraid of different things, or so entrenched in our own experience of the world that we cannot recognize the fears of others. We are learning yet again, and hopefully this time we will be able to live in this knowledge long enough to make real changes to the way our world works. We are learning yet again that there are many who walk around in fear simply because of who they are. For the moment, we are listening to the voices of those who are telling us that they are constantly afraid simply because of the color of their skin. We know this is often also true for people based on their gender identity or sexual orientation or religion or physical or intellectual disability. Audre Lorde, in the poem that Judy read this morning, gives voice to those who live in the margins, whose very existence can feel defined by that fear. For those of us who are imprinted with fear like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, she writes. Those of us who reside among the privileged because of our race, our gender, our socioeconomic status, our current able-bodiedness, may find it hard to understand what it is like 
to move through the world with that kind of vulnerability, where even venturing outside can take courage. It is essential that we try to understand what that is like. Perhaps then, a possible gift of this time, this universally fearful time, is that we can finally see and begin to understand what life is like for some people most or all of the time. This is a challenge. Part of what makes it hard is that although fear is a universal human experience, it is not one that tends to bring us together in the way that joy, love, sorrow, or even anger do. Those emotions tend to send us out into the world looking for others who are sharing our experience. Fear, on the other hand, drives us away from one another into isolation. Maybe we are ashamed or think others wouldn't understand, and so we hide our fears, sometimes under other emotions like anger, sometimes by trying our best to look like we have everything under control. We are often surprised when we discover others have the same fears that we have worked so hard to keep hidden. It can be a gift to discover these shared vulnerabilities, to know that we are not alone. And yet even in this time, when so many of the fears are as near to universal as they could get, fears of illness and death, of loss, of a world changed beyond recognition, we still struggle to connect and instead continue to let our fear divide us. One of the reasons for this perhaps is that what makes some of us feel safe makes others of us more afraid. Newspapers have reported on the uptick in gun purchases in recent months, including many first time gun buyers. Clearly, some people are comforted by taking an action they believe will help them better protect themselves and their families. But others find this very same action to be something that makes the world even more frightening. Or take the efforts to stop the spread of COVID-19 through shutdowns, hand washing and mask wearing. For some, these actions are, if not exactly comfortable, at least helpful in giving us a sense of agency in the face of the crisis. But for others, they simply highlight the risks of the time, keeping fears front and center. The New York Times printed an op-ed piece on June 1st that chronicled people's experiences of wearing masks in the South. Kay West from Asheville, North Carolina shared her story. She wrote, on my way to Charlotte, I had to stop at a convenience store for the restroom. I was the only person of perhaps 20 inside who was masked and was clearly being given the stink eye. I brought a drink to the counter to pay and the employee behind the plexiglass screen asked me if that was all. I said, yes, and he said, take it. I was like, oh, thanks, happy Mother's Day? And he said, no, your mask is scaring us. The very thing that made her feel safer made others afraid. Given all these challenges, both personal and communal, where do we go with our own fear and the fears that others carry? How do we live with all of these fears so overpowering in the moment with opening up rather than shutting down? with reaching out rather than entrenchment? And how do we do it in a time when we are being kept apart by a disease which thrives when we are together? I wish it were as simple as our story this morning makes it seem, that kindness is stronger than fear. Certainly kindness is essential. And if we were all able to start there, the world would be in a much better place. So yes. By all means, let us strive to be kind whenever and wherever we can, even if it feels risky, even if it takes courage. But kindness isn't enough. 
the call to kindness as the only or primary solution to fear papers over all the things there are to be genuinely afraid of and all the harm we can do when we don't recognize the fears of others. I think there is another message in the story that can help lead us in the right direction. When Jitterbug finally sees Pudding's fear as clearly as she feels her own, she reaches out. Let's be afraid together, she says. I wonder if we might begin by recognizing and honoring our own fear, instead of responding to it by trying to shut it or ourselves away, by allowing it to separate us from one another. I wonder if we might use it to call us onward and outward, toward connection rather than isolation, toward shared vulnerability rather than guardedness. I wonder if we can then do the same for others, if we can recognize and honor their fear, see it as a sign of our shared humanity and a reminder of the essential task of building a world that works for all of us. Can we set aside what we want to be true about the world and about who we are long enough to open ourselves to the fear of others, particularly those who live at the margins and whose voices have so often been discarded and dismissed? Maybe even harder than that, can we be open to the fears of those we disagree with? Those who seem to fear the very world we hope to create. At the heart of our Unitarian Universalist faith is the belief that we are all connected, that humanity cannot be divided between us and them that we all belong. In the face of fear, it is easy to lose sight of this connectedness. It is easy to feel alone, to know only that which separates us from one another. It is tempting to try to deny the fear, to lock it away, to refuse to explore what it might mean. May we recognize that impulse and choose to look deeper to see the fear in ourselves and in each other, to know that fear as something which can remind us that we are all in this together. May we allow our faith in our ultimate oneness to give us the courage to open up, to reach out, to live wholeheartedly, even when the path ahead is uncertain and frightening. May we find that in doing so, we bring the world that we seek more fully into being. May it be so. Amen. Though we extinguish our chalice flame, we carry within us what we kindled, the light of inspiration, warmth of compassion, the fire of commitment. May we bring these gifts into our lives and share them radiantly out in the world. I invite you to join me now in our community blessing with these words from David Bumbach. This church is dedicated to the proposition that behind all our differences and beneath all our diversity, there is a unity that makes us one and binds us forever together in spite of time, death, and the space between the stars. We pause now in silent witness to that unity. We close with these words, some of my favorite words of all time by the Reverend Wayne Arneson. Take courage, friends. The way is often hard, the path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down there is another truth. You are not alone. May it be so.
Amen.